It shows you a kind of thread that runs through everything Filipinos do. That if you had Rizal taking probably 20 post shots to send this message out to his countrymen that, hey, we can do this. This is another picture uh, taken in January 1899. And I don't know if you can see it very clearly, but there's this uh, gentleman here in top hat tails, surrounded by lots of other people in top hats and tails. Uh, if you look closely, surrounded by lots of soldiers in gold braid, except half of the soldiers have no shoes. In a provincial plaza, where you know it's arranged so the church is there, and the city hall is here, and all the prominent families are around there to show who matters. And it's a strange sort of very Filipino mixture of people dressed to the nines and people trying to dress to the nines and just everyone just sort of crowding and it's a little vaguely disorganized but everyone's just sort of having a good time and you can tell there's a lot of music in the background. But what is the story being told? It's a story of hierarchy, that there are the haves and the have-nots. It's a story of achievement you're inaugurating your first president. It's a story of community. Rich and poor alike are together in celebration. And it's a story of ambition. That here are these people, he was just a municipal mayor from a little hick town and has now proclaimed himself the president of an entire country in the span of two years. Something that many Filipinos today would even question whether you should even have this ambition. And yet, here they were. Another story, another picture from, this is 1899, this picture is from 1922. Taken down south, I, I, if I'm not mistaken, this was actually taken uh, somewhere near Cebu. And again, what does it tell you? You don't even know, need to know who these people are. Um, you would have some of them, you only know as a street. This is Teodoro M. Galao, so that's the M. Galao down there. Yeah. Right um, this is Fuente Osmeña. And this is Quezon Boulevard. But it's the story they're trying to tell. And it's a story that very few Filipinos today would have even bothered to try to tell of a very physical closeness and friendship between cultures that we think are meant to be at odds with each other. And again, as propaganda, it's a fantastic piece of propaganda. And all the better because they actually look comfortable with each other, which is rather amazing. And again, what you would have today is not this sort of picture where people are, in a sense, secure enough to say, I am a Christian belonging to a Western tradition, so I will wear a suit. And you will have a Moro saying, I am a Moro belonging to my own traditions, holding my sword. We are who we are, but we are brothers. Today, you would have a Filipino politician who probably goes to mass, trying to put on a loincloth, and holding the sword and looking very silly to everyone, but that's how he thinks he should be, by pandering to the other guy, instead of making arms. Where is this going? Why, do, why have we lost this sort of sense of self-identity to the extent that we're just engaging in a kind of fakery? It, I guess it starts with nostalgia. <clears throat> that you can have a picture like this which makes a very nice postcard and sort of gives you this, the idea that whatever the modern conveniences around the real authentic Philippines is the guy with the carabao cart. And the idea that you can still have a modern city where you're riding around on your little caritela and it's very quaint and because it's quaint it's more authentic. But it ignores the reality at the time that perhaps your carabao cart is simply due to the fact that there was no means to get a loan to buy a truck where you could get your goods 
to market much more quickly and efficiently when that is what is supposed to market when your purpose in life is not to pose for picture postcards but to make money. My point is that we have been conditioned to think that the quaint is safe, that the picturesque is the ideal, that the modern and the efficient is somehow alien and something we should not be engaging in. And in a way, for those of us who have tried to learn, who have tried to improve ourselves, who have tried to bring the best of the world here and be a part of the forces that contribute to the rest of the world, ironically, this remains our mental image of ourselves. So many Filipinos and many Filipinos that foreigners encounter sometimes have to purge themselves of their being Filipino just to prove that they are at the same level with other people when no one has been asking them to do this and when no one is expecting them to do this. It's the same reason that I've had classmates and now that my friends are beginning to have children of their own and some of them are already in school, that there's a certain discomfort because their mental map of the Philippines is the quaint and the picturesque and not the modern or the interesting or the innovative. Which is a very strange sort of mental defeatism to have at the start. It's the idea that we're taught these pictures in school, we carry this mental image around with, our, with us ourselves, not realizing that even at the time, they were staged, they were in a sense very fake images and divorced from the reality of the time. We're carrying around a nostalgia that, of course, nostalgia by itself is you have a very rosy image of what not necessarily was the case, but in this case, it's a particularly harmful image that we have. And it leads to a kind of really weird comfort. The idea that every time you achieve something, it is despite your having been Filipino, or it's despite your culture. And that therefore, you have to work double time to assert something that many other people have no problem about. They have no problem with the strange foods we like to eat, or the way we engage in karaoke, or the fact that we have a boxer who is a congressman. It may be kind of different, but a lot of other people have already gotten to the stage where it's vivla difference. And yet for us, we still want to purge ourselves of these differences. And it's a comfort bubble that is self-defeating um, in many ways. It isn't helped. And that's why you have to thank God for places like Beacon, where, on the other hand, it can get so defensive and so shrill and so combative that you don't even know what anyone stands for anymore. This is a problem you see outside. Yesterday, we were at a conference called the PPP conference, where there were many investors who were here to look at the country and to see that it was time to do business in the country. It went like clockwork, it went very well, except halfway through the event, 30 communists showed up outside the Marriott Hotel and started screaming. And you know it, it, it entered the news. It was 600 people who paid good money to come to the Philippines to see if they should invest, versus 30 communists screaming outside the hotel. The communists got more airtime. And again, you know it sends off a bad message. You know, at the same time, those at the conference shrugged it off. Filipinos probably got a little more hysterical about the whole thing than anyone from overseas, because what's 30 communists compared to you know, the way they were rioting in Washington, D.C. over WTO? My point being that the chaos and the noise and the inability to agree on anything is itself a kind of defeatism. That if we assume this is the default situation, it is not. How many of you have encountered 30 communists writing? Long time, I'm sure. Maybe some of your workers on their way to work. 
But it's not the way life is really here. You know it and I know it. The media doesn't know it. And the politicians like to feed it. But it's not the way it is. And yet it is the comfortable way for them. So how are we going to emerge from this and why do we need to emerge from it? Because of this. This is from the Boston Globe. I, to my mind, one of the most powerful images of what, to my mind, was and will remain for our, all of us in this room, the defining moment of our lives. Typhoon Ontoy and Typhoon Pepeng marked the end of the Philippines and life as we knew it, and the beginning of the way it's going to be for the foreseeable future for us, for your children, possibly for their children. A place where nothing is predictable anymore, where nature itself is something that can really smack you over the head at any given time. Where whatever we do, however modern we try to be, we're just eventually going to hit a wall somehow. Now, why is this the defining moment? Because Russia has this problem, Europe has this problem, the United States is having this problem, other parts of Asia, China, are having this problem. And we responded to it in very unique ways, and yet very universal ways. It didn't matter anymore if you were rich or poor on this event. It didn't matter if you what party you belonged to. It didn't matter where you lived because there was always someone you cared about somewhere else who was run, rushing for their lives. And if this was a big example of everything wrong in this country where we can't plan things and do things with quality, it was also a demonstration of how we get over the most unimaginable things and emerge the better for it. All it took was for people to really get a concrete demonstration that there is no such thing as a comfort zone or a comfort bubble anywhere. You may have actually been in an area that was on high ground, but you couldn't get anywhere else because there were other places underwater. You had people who had all the money in the world, but it couldn't get their kid home from Nasal, where everyone was trapped for two days because the flood waters were high, and so on and so forth. It's the idea that if you shouldn't have to face the removal of your comfort zone to start plotting how to remove that comfort zone. That if you just study where we came from, who we are, the many things out there that can connect the dots in interesting and surprising ways, you can start emerge realizing you can be a little more ambitious, you can be a little more imaginative, you can be a lot more daring, and you can achieve a whole lot more because it's already been done in many ways. It's just recognizing that we are not quaint, we are not picturesque, we are a pretty outstanding group of people and that if we have responded in this way, imagine the lessons we can learn from everyone else. For those of us who have foreign classmates or friends from other parts of the world, it's trading these stories and exchanging the things we've learned about best practices that can inspire that light bulb moment, whether it's for your business or your personal life or for the problems you're facing with your kids or that they're going through on their own. And so, even if the reality, and this is from the 1960s, even if the reality can be daunting, the hope is still there. The examples are still there. And you know, we can debate all you know until the cows come home whether we should be focusing on Rizal and it's unhealthy to be focusing on Pacquiao. But there are commonalities. There is the same will to fight that is sadly lacking in too many people. And there is the same level of hope and concern and aspiration. So Perhaps this was a little more of an academic look at this question than you were expecting, but I hope it will uh, lead you to go and look around 
and develop and connect those dots for yourself.